Hi everyone, today's just a little bit of a bonus episode. We recently had the pleasure to speak with Master Jeff Speakman and he gave us a tour of his developing the system of American Kempo 5.0 as well as his background in Goju Ryu Karate. Now if you have not seen those episodes, please find them down in the link below. There's some fascinating stuff that he talked to us about. But also when we were talking, we just had some extra questions and topics and back and forth and just some life aspects and some candid stuff. So today's just a little bit of a bonus episode, uh, an off the mat discussion if you will. So just sit back and enjoy and like I said, please be uh, sure to check out the other videos the interviews we have with him and this is just a look at life movies and philosophy with master just speakman uh, you know i always go back to chuck norris as the octagon um for a couple of reasons one is you can obviously see the quality of the martial arts that was in that movie is phenomenal especially when you put it back in the the day of when it was done um and i personally know Mr. Norris, and uh, I think he's just one of the most outstanding people I've ever met. And interestingly enough, when I was coming out with the perfect weapon, of course, you're with Paramount, this big company, and I'm about to go on a world tour and open this movie. I mean, it was a big deal. <clears throat> so they hired uh, a very, very popular company about to, so they could come in and teach me about public speaking and about how to present yourself. And so I went through this whole thing with that. They prepped me for going around the world. And here's what's interesting. They would say to me over and over again, you know, they would say, here's what you need to do. And here's that. And you know, who's great at that is Chuck Norris. He's, he's the best at this kind of thing. And, and it's true. He was the best because the guy's a genuine human being who really cares about other people. And I just found it really interesting that they over and over again would say, Oh, and by the way, the guy you want to look at is Chuck Norris. So, there's my admiration for what he's done in film. My great pleasure to have met him. And it's also that he's done so many wonderful things with his life that he wound up being, you know, an example for me to follow. Uh, so that's why I love that movie and, and what he's done with his life. You know, I, I came very close to death in 2013 with my uh, stage four throat cancer. And when you come out of something like that, you, you're, I mean, look, you're changed. You know, you can't, you can't go through something like that and go, oh, well, great, I'm glad that's over. What's next? You know, you just, you know, you're, you're a completely changed person. And I became deeply motivated to make the greatest impact I can through the martial arts, through the Kempo 50, through the 50 family, however you want to look at it, and found that before. I wasn't able to do that, and I didn't even know why, because when I came out of the cancer and it looked like I was going to live and I felt like I was going to live going back to the gym every day, and I had like the strength of a 12-year-old, <laughs> you know, I was just a mess. I lost 80 pounds, eight zero pounds in those times. I had uh, 34 sessions of radiation five days a week with eight uh, sessions of chemotherapy simultaneous. So every week I had my chemo with my radiation. And it was seven, eight hours at the hospital that day when I did both those things. And lost all that weight, was heavily addicted to the um, Oxycontin that I had to take because it was tongue cancer, but throat and the pain, swallowing, you can't swallow. So I lost all that weight. Anyway, when I came out of that, and was uh, close to not making it out of that. <clears throat> I had a feeding tube, you know, 18 inches of tube circled around and taped to my stomach and had to inject uh, for, for quite some time. That's, that's, those were the darkest days of my life, no doubt. And then when you come out of that, I thought, you know, I, I really don't have any fear anymore. I really don't. I'm going to come out. I'm going to say the way it is. This is the way it's supposed to be. We should, all this stuff that you and I have gone over. But interestingly, I, for, it took me three years, but then I started asking this question that I didn't answer for three years, which is, okay, you feel this liberation that you're no longer afraid. What were you afraid of? Because <laughs> I never thought of myself as a fearful person, <clears throat> but yet I felt intuitively this lift of a fear and the limiting factors of what fear does to you. And after like three years, I realized it was the, the fear of, 
of standing up and saying, nope, we're not doing that. We're doing this. We're doing this thing we call Kempo Fiber. And there's all these people that are my seniors and they, you're not doing anything about it. So I am. And I'm not going to feel guilty about that anymore. I'm not going to be afraid of whether you like me or you don't like me or you prove it or you don't prove of it. I'm no longer judging my life on your opinion. A good friend of mine by the name of Bob White, a very uh, well-known Kempo practitioner, <clears throat> told me something many, many years ago that has been one of the truths of my life. And he said, other people's opinion of me is none of my business. And I thought, wow, that's because that's what was killing you, right? I was getting these negative opinions from all these people who, by the way, weren't doing anything to change the art, evolve and create solutions, but they were bombarding me with this over email from my own Kempo family. And they were just treating me like not good. And then I went, okay, we're not doing that anymore. And if you don't like it, then you don't like it. And, and if you're gonna come over here and beat me up, okay, go ahead and do that. It isn't gonna mean that you're right because you can beat me up. It just means this is what you're gonna do. And I'm not changing. I'm moving full force forward with what I intuitively know. This is what Ed Parker wanted me to do. And, and, and when I came out of the cancer, I said, okay, I'm not holding back on that anymore. I'm doing it no matter what. So that's how we, we move forward with uh, Kempo 5 -0. What is your favorite unwritten rule? Wow. I think all my rules are written. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I have an unwritten rule. Um, I'm one of these really weird people who actually read books. And, and I have for a long time. I'm sitting here in my office and there's <clears throat> stacks of books all over the place. Um, I really believe in, di in diverse opinions, you know, uh, uh, and I respect people. I respect uh, one of the, the things I used to, to look at and judge if someone is an intelligent person or not is can they argue the other side of their position? You know, can you come up and give me the A and the B? I choose A for this, but I recognize that B is that. If we can have that kind of conversation, I can go, okay, I can get my head around. It. I go, oh, how interesting. I never thought of it that way. Well, what do you think of that? See, now we're having an interplay. But we are, when people come up and they simply, you know, make a statement, then their feet are dug in about that, and they're going to argue that position. I'm gonna, okay, you know, if you want to do that, I guess we'll do that. But I don't see where we're all going to come out ahead of that. I'll listen to you, but you need to listen to me. And we need to do this ping pong thing back and forth. And even if you don't like what I have to say, you need to listen and, and judge whether what I'm saying is something that's important or not. Either way is fine with me. But we're not going to get anywhere until we get this. When, when humans confuse absolute truth with relative truth is where you see the very worst of what it is to be a human. What is something you wish people would ask you? Oh, gosh, you know, I, um, I think I'd like to answer that by saying, instead of, instead of pinpointing what I want them to ask me, I just wish that people would ask me whatever, you know, I, I have become isolated in my world, not by my choice but by the choice of other people who don't want to hear what I have to say. And so it's the absence of that interaction. It's the absence of the, the communication that I think is a problem and it's gonna to continue to be a problem. What makes you laugh? Pretty much everything. <laughs> I have uh, often described myself as having Tourette's syndrome with sarcasm <clears throat> because I just, I just can't help myself, you know, I let it, let it fly. Even if I know I'm going to be the only one who gets the joke and laughs, I still say it anyhow, <laughs> you know, um, it, I'm all constantly looking for humor and enjoyment. And then, uh, it's one of the things I share very closely with my five old family. They're all the same way. And, you know, we got to find a way to laugh. We got to find a way to smile <clears throat> and talk and think of positive things. Um, and, um, and just my interaction with 
everybody, the, the, the life I live now, this amazing marriage that I have, this wonderful person that I found. And life is very, very rich and rewarding for me right now. And I plan on keeping it that way until it's time for me to transition to the other side. And I just hope that, and, and with all intent, I, I set up the Kempo 50 world to move on when I'm dead. And it's, it's a system that's set up that, that isn't dependent on me. And I don't want it to be because I want those people that I love dearly to continue to have a good life and believe in what they built so their children can come in and then the next generation and the next. And it lives and it grows on its own.